Lately, there's been a lot of buzz about artificial intelligence. A lot of the news articles out today are just that, news articles. Hardly any of them explain how this artificial intelligence works. If you're anything like me, you don't simply want to know what something is. You want to know how it works. You want to know how it's made, and you want to know how you can make it better. If you can understand how something works, how you can build it, and you can envision a way that it fulfills a human need, you'll be an extremely successful person. Now, within the space of artificial intelligence, I want to talk about a topic known as the genetic algorithm. If we look at all life on Earth today, we can suppose it has solved the problem of survival on our planet. In this case, we can say we've identified the problem, survival of life. But now that we've identified the problem, let's ask how has life solved that problem in order to survive on our planet? Now, if we observe carefully, we can make a guess that the creatures alive today exhibit physical features that enable it to survive in its environment. These features are things like arms, legs, a brain, lungs, an exoskeleton, a backbone. We call these things phenotypes, the physical manifestation of a being. But when we think about this concept, it automatically brings in a series of questions to us. The first question is, what underlying architecture results in these physical features? In the case of living things, we know that it's DNA, and we call this the genotype. Now, the second question that we ask is, where did these organisms come from? When we look at what's alive today, we know that they originated from their parents. But what about their parents' parents? Or their parents' parents' parents? Now, for the purposes of this discussion, we're only concerned about a smaller time window. If we want to go to time goes to infinity, we still don't really know the origin of life. But that's not really our concern today. The third question that we have to ask is why does one group survive and another group die off? How does a physical manifestation allow for survival and propagation of a species? And mostly, can we quantify those who are best suited to survival? Now finally, the last question that we ask is how did these organisms change over time? This final question feeds in to all of the previous questions. So it loops into question one by asking whether the underlying architecture dictating the physical manifestation of the organism changes over time. Then it feeds into question two. Because if an organism's DNA is changed and it reproduces, what happens to the species overall? And then the final question is, can it survive? And can we quantify that survival? In simply asking these questions, we've already developed our evolutionary genetic algorithm. And I'll show you using this example of color. So our first step in creating the algorithm is to define the problem. So for us, we want the computer to show a particular color. And for our case, we're going to use this particular shade of green. Now the physical manifestation of the object is this shade of green that we can recognize as humans. But the underlying architecture that dictates how this is green is going to be within its hexadecimal value. We can call this value its DNA. Now, if you understand colors on a computer for red, green, and blue space, we know that a hexadecimal number corresponds to 24 bits. And these bits are just ones and zeros. And the first eight digits on the right are the red channel. The middle eight is the green channel. And the eight on the right are your blue channel. And because there's 24 ones and zeros, we call this 24-bit color. Each hexadecimal value represents four digits of ones or zeros. And if you know anything about binary, the values for red, green, and blue can go anywhere from 0 to 255. Meaning that you can have 256 times 256 times 256 possible colors in the 24-bit space. This comes out to 16.7 million colors. So now that we know the problem of trying to get the computer to display green, we know the phenotype in the manifestation of the color green, and we know the genotype as 24-bit color, we can begin our algorithm. So the first thing that we do in the algorithm is we create a random population. In the case of what you see on the screen, there's 2,304 citizens in this particular population. The reason being is that this is a grid of 64 by 32. Now, the number of 2,304 is arbitrary, but you do need a large enough population. Typically, I see at least 1,000 
Now each color here in this grid, which is the population, represents a citizen. Each citizen has a random genotype, which manifests itself in the color that you see on the screen. So now when we run the algorithm, we examine the genotype of each citizen starting from the top left all the way to the bottom right, going left to right and top to down. And what we do is we assess the fitness of each citizen bit by bit according to the target. For example, this citizen has a shade of purple. When we compare the genotype of the citizen to the target, we go bit by bit. And for each place that matches, we're going to add one. And if it doesn't match, we don't add anything. Meaning that a citizen that has the most matches is going to be the most fit and is considered the most like the shade of green that we want the computer to display. Once each citizen has an associated fitness, we sort the population. The most fit members are going to be put at the top left in decreasing order all the way to the bottom right, which is the least fit citizen, the least like the green that we're looking for. Now, the second step of the algorithm is that we randomly mate citizens with each other, about 60% in this case, although that value is also arbitrary. For example, we randomly pick this citizen and we take the first five bits of it and then combine it with the last 19 bits of this particular citizen. And once we've achieved 60% mating in this population, we've created a child generation. Now, within the child generation, the one thing that we do is we randomly mutate 25% of them. 25% is, again, an arbitrary number. But what we do is we pick a random citizen and we look at its genotype. And say at bit number 7, if it's a 1, we turn it into a 0. And if it's a 0, we turn it into a 1. Then we sort the child population by fitness again. And the children become parents who then make children. And over several generations, as we repeat, we sort, mate, mutate, sort, mate, mutate. Over several different generations, we find convergence of the population to the color green that we're looking for. For this algorithm, once we get to 95% convergence, meaning that 95% of the citizens on here become the green that we're looking for, the target then finds a new color to converge the population to. So now with this algorithm, there's many different things that we can do that would mimic the actual biology that we see in nature. There's things like genetic shift, frame shift mutations, duplication, repeat expansion, elitism, and there's other tools that we can use to make this algorithm more or less deterministic, meaning that we can find the solution that we're looking for in a shorter amount of time and in less generations. Now the fitness calculation here in this color example is very simple. We compare bit by bit and for every match we add one, for every unmatch we don't add anything. For many other algorithms, there's more complicated fitness equations that could be used. They could employ complicated equations, they could employ neural networks, and they could even employ machine learning in them. Now you can begin to see that this is an extremely powerful tool to be able to solve a problem in which we don't know what the answer looks like. There's another visual example here using cars and other different qualifying features within the genome that manifest itself in different phenotypes. A real world example of this was NASA used a genetic algorithm to find an optimal shape of an antenna in order to receive signal based on the conditions that they applied to it. You can read more in the description below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Adios, amigos.